Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. How bad are the problems of big money and uber-powerful corporations in American politics? And are they eroding people's trust in elections, their elected leaders, and even democracy itself? Let's get to the bottom line. In the last presidential election cycle, more than $2 billion was raised and spent by the top two candidates, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. This time around, we have some fabulously wealthy candidates, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, Tom Steyer, and even Donald Trump, though we're still waiting for proof in his never-released tax forms, while other candidates pride themselves on not accepting any big money. With the top 1% of this country getting even richer, and the poor getting poorer, and the middle collapsing out of the middle class, and concentration of money in fewer and fewer hands, what is happening to the solvency of we the people? Fortunately, we have some folks with us today who have the answers. Matt Stoller is the research director of the American Economic Liberties Project and the author of Goliath, the 100-year war between monopoly power and democracy. Michael Fontroy is a professor of political science at Howard University here in Washington, D.C. And joining us from Stanford, Connecticut, is Republican strategist Liz Mayer, who's been advising political candidates for years. Thank you all so much for joining us today. This is a big, heavy topic. Matt, let me start with you. You've written this book, uh, Goliath, out there. It really takes a historic look at the concentration of power and money and how that was ill-served at one point in the nation, how it was toppled. But you think we're back in that time. So what's the danger today? Well, so over the last 25 years or so, more than 75% of American industries have become more concentrated. So we are facing a crisis of monopoly. And what we see in the political realm is the manifestation of that. Uh, this is new, uh, but we have experienced something like it before in the 1920s and 30s. We faced robber barons who concentrated power across our political economy. Uh, we defeated them in the 1930s during the New Deal. And then in the 1970s, we made a series of intellectual choices to unleash concentrated power once again. And so today we have concentration in everything from cheerleading to missiles and munitions to search engines to social networks. And then you have a bunch of monopolists uh, like Michael Bloomberg, for example, who are running for president and who are using the money that they extract from... How is Michael Bloomberg a monopolist? So he runs uh, basically a, an instant messaging and data service for hedge funds and banks. And you have to use it uh, to communicate with your clients. Does um, Reuters have uh, the, there, a similar there, there service? There are some, some similarities, and they, they do have a, a data service. But in terms of the instant messaging, you have to have a Bloomberg terminal if you want to communicate. It's just you can't you can't avoid it if you're at a certain level on Wall Street. And they have they are overfunded Wall Street because of we've enabled finance. And so Michael Bloomberg has pricing power. So every year he personally earns. You know, we don't know because it's a private company, but probably one to four billion dollars of just straight up cash, which he can use to finance anything that he wants. And right now he he's financing a presidential campaign and buying most of the Democratic Party. Liz, let me ask you about whether you have the similar concerns that Matt Stoller does about the concentration of wealth and power as a as something that's a contagion, as a real problem, a disease to democracy, if you will. With regard to elections, I would say I don't quite share Matt's concerns, and I'll come back to why in just a minute as a political consultant. I will say when we're talking about things like big tech, I do have some concerns, particularly there's a lot of work that I personally have done looking at Google and the amount of power that they have, um, privacy infractions, these kinds of things. I do have a lot of concerns about that and monopolists, uh, monopolies in that context and the extensive power that they exert. But in the political realm, I mean, let's just jump to Mike Bloomberg since he's who was mentioned first. It is astonishing to me, and I see this over and over and over again in politics, how much people who have a ton of money that they can spend in an unfettered way who aren't necessarily reliant on small dollar donations, for example, to keep them accountable to individuals, just burn their money on the most insanely stupid stuff that does not do anything to advance their political fortunes. So, I mean, a couple good examples with regard to Mike Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg apparently has somebody on staff who is being paid quite a lot of money. Uh, I can't remember the exact figure when I, when I sort of poked around about this, but quite a lot of money. And uh, this person or these people who are consultants, literally what they're getting paid to do 
is reach out to so-called Twitter influencers and offer them something like, I think it's $6,000, to just post favorable Mike Bloomberg content. This has become a matter of huge ridicule. Um, one of the accounts that they reached out to is an account called El Bloombito, which is run by a friend of mine, which basically makes fun of Mike Bloomberg's inability to speak Spanish, you know, and offering to collaborate or seeing if they can find a way to, like, spin the content of that account. I, I don't know whether Mike Bloomberg, maybe he's making $4 billion a year off of Bloomberg terminals, but if he's spending it on that kind of thing in a campaign context, he might as well just be setting his money but, on fire for right. all of us to watch. But and Liz, with it, regard to advertising, I, I would say the same thing. I mean, I, I don't want to run on here, but... I live in the New York media market. I'm pretty sure everybody in the New York media market knows who Mike Bloomberg is, knows what his accomplishments are, knows what his liabilities are. Um, there's no reason that he needs to be advertising here. This is a totally blue area. The primary is not going to come until late. And I swear to God, if you put on TV between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m., you are going to see at least eight Mike Bloomberg ads. And this is the most expensive media market in the country. Again, he might as well be taking his so, money. So, Liz, and you're talking as a It would actually be more effective. Right. Well, you're talking as a strategist, and that's one thing, and I understand yes, I that. Am. And the other side, though, is on what somebody should be doing or not be doing with their money. You know, I think that the that, uh, First Amendment gives people, you know, the freedom of speech, the ability to uh, make political mm -hmm. comments, to, to, to do the things. And, and, you know, if they want to spend money foolishly, our system sort of lets them do that. But isn't that a different thing than arguing that a fabulously, bil you know, rich billionaire is essentially somehow undermining and cutting off the way a healthy democratic ecosystem should work? So I'm interested in the difference well, between kind of foolishness and kind of getting the equilibrium right in a dem democratic ecosystem. Well, I think if, if you have if you have the foolish expenditure, it's very difficult to undermine the system because you're doing something that's utterly ineffective, right? In order to undermine a system, you have to be doing something that's effective. And I would say when you look at money in politics, where people are usually complaining about it, generally speaking, right. the groups or the individuals they're talking about are wildly ineffective. You know, I've never actually received any Koch brothers money except for like, I don't know, a hundred bucks for a couple of reason articles, I guess, maybe is partly Koch funded. So I'll just go ahead and trash the Koch brothers here. But you know, they get a bad rap for spending so much money to procure political outcomes. But if you actually look at what they do, they are so wildly ineffective that I really honestly wonder why anybody's particularly concerned about them. Um, we'll see. Maybe Tom Steyer will prove to be more effective with his money in South Carolina, and maybe we'll be having a different conversation, and I'll take a different tone after that. But as of right now, it looks like Tom Steyer's billions. He spent a ton of money to get to what, like seven percent? Right. I mean, I, I just I just don't buy that well, you can right. totally okay. undermine the system by being ineffective. Michael, I mean, is the problem for you as you see it? I, I, again, I'm trying to think about. Let's imagine a healthy democratic ecosystem. You respond. To, you know, you've heard Liz. You've heard Matt. What are the pieces that matter for you? Is it money? Is it something else? Well, you can't talk about a healthy democratic system without talking about money. That's a part of the central core of it. So, you know, setting aside for a second the money part, which I hope to, to be able to get back to, for me, you can't have a healthy democracy or a healthy democratic eco ecosystem without a, a well-informed electorate. And so part of the problem here is that there is a lot of money that has been used not just by candidates in support of their own attempts to win office, but also money spent to misinform pub the public about certain things that are going on in public policy. So you have people who actually believe things that are not true. And so when people vote and behave based on untrue things, then that is as effective as Liz mentioned a second ago, an effective use of money, misdirecting people or, or, or em emphasizing certain things that are less important than other things that are more important. And that happens just as much so as... So make it real system. for me. Tell me... You know, we've, we've heard about Facebook. We've right. heard about ads on Google. Twitter has banned political ads, which was in, uh, in, an interesting step for them to take. What would you have them do in the space that, that would, would lead to a healthier system but not right. censorship? Well, I, I'm not for censorship. Let me start there. So you're not for censorship, but I, I'm for, Facebook runs bad things. I'm not even, I'm not even talking about yeah. Facebook at this okay. point. I'm talking at that at a much more gra grassroots level. We have uh, an electorate that, that receives countless numbers of ads and consumes countless amounts of information from sources that are purposely misleading them. And so when you look at 
the various ways in which uh, citizens receive their information and, and actively believe things that mm. are not true, then to me, that is where the real corrosion occurs in our democratic system. There are people out there who mm. believe that the economy is doing well, and I think you can find some data points that demonstrate that. But if you live in Nebraska or in the heartland of the United States or you rely on agriculture, you might not know that, 20, that, that, that farm bankruptcies are up 20 percent this mm. year over last year. You may not know if you hear a lot in, in the public discourse about mm. how the President Trump is black unemployment, for example, as if that's evident, evidence that black, that black communities are doing better. But the reality is the black home ownership rate is at a 50-year low. The black male participation. So when you hear rate, Donald Trump say that, you want to scream. Well, I well I do scream, but yeah. that's another yeah. story. My my point yeah. is that too often we rely on one or two data right. points to tell a larger story that isn't backed up by the full range and breadth of the information that we receive. So Matt, you, you know, I you, think that's. Okay, go ahead, Liz. I was, sorry, I was just going to say I think that's true, but I think that actually drives it. What a couple points that are really important here. When we're talking about money in politics, the overwhelming majority of that money is spent on ads, and ads are actually a fairly ineffective way of communicating information to people and influencing voter opinion. What's far more effective is earned media. Of course, I'm a strategic communications consultant, so I have to say this, it's my industry. But in reality, if you go back and you look at 2016, it wasn't money that procured the result for Donald Trump. Actually, the thing that correlates most strongly to electoral outcomes mm. is the share of earned media coverage that a candidate gets. And that's where I think we do have a problem, because as much as I like working with ideological media on both the right and the left, you do have a situation where quite a lot of those people deliberately overlook things that are counter to their philosophical driver. And you also have a situation in mainstream media where you have a massive decline of local media, you have a decline of investigative media, and you have a lot of a shift towards employing um, younger reporters who don't necessarily have 10 or 15 years worth of experience to vet stories that can be very important about candidates and can provide people with some really valuable information. Those people aren't in a, a position where they're able to make good decisions. So you do end up with an uninformed electorate. But that's not because of the Koch brothers spending money necessarily. That's not because of Mike Bloomberg wasting all of his money advertising to people in Connecticut who probably already like him. Look, I'm, that's I'm sorry. That's because of sorry, other problems gonna, in the system. I'm going to have to step in. Look, it's not just about ads. And Mike Bloomberg is not wasting his money. He is rising in the polls. Let, like, there's, there's, a, there's a believe me, not your lying eyes thing going on here. Mike, there are two billionaires on the debate stage. The president of the United States is a billionaire. Money matters, okay? And let me just give you a quick example. Maybe. The Center for American Progress, it's not just about ads. The Center for American Progress is the most important think tank on the Democratic side. They got a lot of money from Bloomberg, and then they were trying to publish a, a, a report on, on a, a whole bunch of aspects of civil liberties, and they explicitly took out the piece on Mike Bloomberg setting up a Muslim surveillance unit in, in New York City because they were getting money from, Blo from, from Mike Bloomberg. And this happens across the board. It happens with every big corporation in D.C. that gives money. They are controlling and structuring the debate internally in here. They are also spending a lot of money on ads. So a lot of ads don't work. A lot of ads do work. But I will just say that when we're talking about the, the crisis of concentration, we are not just talking about ads. 2,000 out of, out of um, 3,000 American counties now have no daily newspaper. And this is a direct result, a direct result of Facebook and Google concentrating power over the flow of ad money in this country. That is a crisis for democracy. It is a crisis of concentration. So how do you fix it, Matt? Because that, to a certain degree... That's true, degree, but that's not political campaigns. Just to be clear, that's... If we're talking about this in the context no, of political No, it is political campaigns. campaigns. It's absolutely political campaigns. Mark Zuckerberg no, is structuring... If you, if you're talking, excuse me, can you just let me talk? Mark Zuckerberg is, is structuring how we talk about politics right now. He is structuring what kind of ads people can run and what kind of ads people can't run. Right. That so, is absolutely about politics. So my question to you is, how is what you're saying new and different now that hasn't been part of the political dialogue for a, quite a long time? Well, it's not, it's not entirely new and different. It's just more extreme. So in the mid-1970s, and I go into this in Goliath, there was a really radical shift in both political parties where they stopped seeing concentrations of private power as a threat to democracy. This is the main character of my book, is a congressman named Wright Patman. He was overthrown. From Texas, right? From a Texas. populist, he was, yeah. he was the chair of the banking committee, and he was overthrown essentially by Bill Clinton's generation, right, the, the Watergate babies. And they didn't, they weren't suspicious of concentrated private power. And then in 78, you had 
Newt Gingrich's generation come in and take over the Republican Party. You roll that forward 40 years. You roll up the monopolization of the political economy for 40 years, and you have what we have today, which is a whole set of billionaires that are running our politics in a set of institutions concentrating right. private power, people like Mark Zuckerberg right. that Michael? are structuring it. So you mentioned uh, organizations in D.C. that blow the whistle on some of this kind of thing. Well, the money, to your point, helps explain why we aren't hearing them, right? It's mm. the size of the whistle, and the size of the whistle is informed in some measure by how much money and how much reach you have. Yes, it may be true that some of these ads don't do much to Im impact the way people think, but they help to reinforce what people already believe based on the information they've gathered in other places. So I just think that when you look at some of these good government organizations, as, as we might mm -hmm. call them, we have to understand that when they help provide legitimacy in our political system, they are now wildly out, outmaneuvered by tremendous amounts of money and influence and strategic decisions that are being made that do not allow them to play the role that so they So when I look me, at it, this me, is, me, I look at just... Can I take issue with that? Really quickly. Yeah. yeah. So also, these, these part of the problem is these whistleblowing agencies are ideologically ill set up because the problem we have is political, and they try to claim that they're apolitical, that they're nonpartisan. This is a political problem. It's an ideological problem, and we need political leaders to run against it. And that's what's happening right now. I think that's why they've always failed. I think part of what Liz has put on the table, which I find so interesting, because it does look at the responsible responsibility of media and other voices like mm -hmm. these groups, is I look at every entity. I've, I've come from think tanks. I've been in media. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, worked in the government. Uh, and I think Liz is right that there's a certain um, ecosystem out there, a kind of sound system, if you will, Part of it is responsible, and part of it, you know, when you look at the earned media side, which is really trying to say, how do you get your story told in a high-quality way? Is that is that a fair uh, depiction, Liz? Yeah, I think that that is. I think that is fair. And how do you get? I mean, if you're running against the equivalent of not to borrow uh, from Matt overly, but if you're running against the equivalent of a Goliath, right? How do you get negative information out there about that person if that is valuable information that voters need to have? I mean, that's something that. I've struggled with. I bet Matt struggled well, with it in some context, too. That's a really serious problem. But I do want to make the distinction. If we're talking about politics, I think it's important to distinguish politics from policy. Because when I'm talking politics, I'm talking campaigns and elections. And the reality is that the overwhelming majority of money in those campaigns and elections is spent on running TV ads, which are massively ineffective. I do believe, yes, as, as we've discussed, that when you're talking about certain things and memes that appear on Facebook, they can help reinforce and sort of amp up what people already think. But that's a pretty small part out of the puzzle. I also agree with Matt, though, that when we're talking about groups and we're talking about policy and an effort to influence policy, that, yes, third-party groups do play an important role. And, yes, they can be bought and sold. Many of them are extraordinarily transactional. Um, you know, I've been placed in situations where I've gone to people who have an existing interest in a policy issue that I, ha I am working on and have said, you know, hey, maybe this right. is something you'd be interested in throwing up a blog post about. And I've literally been have had people turn around and say, yeah, give me $25,000. That's a problem. It is a problem. I admit that. But I just think when we're talking about politics, we have to be distinct about that because that's where you really get into, oh, my God, money is such a huge problem. And it's mostly being burned on TV ads. That I want to ask the three of you a, a big question. I was with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse the other night who had written his book called Captured. Some of the similar themes, not all, but some uh, similar in Goliath. His point is that the legal decision uh, in the Supreme Court for, called Citizens United, and for those who don't know it, this is a decision that if essentially gave corporations the right to be a person, to be an individual, to, uh, to act in a political system and to give money and to have uh, a kind of freedom of speech that makes no distinction between that corporation and individual. And Senator Whitehouse's comment was that this has killed the ability of the parties to work together, that the corporations have become so powerful in controlling the message, in punishing legislators that wander uh, off away from, that might wander off, that it has created an inability to work on issue after issue after issue of major concern, like climate change was the one that he was discussing. And, I, I, Michael, I'd like to hear from you on whether you share Senator Whitehouse's perspective on that and whether that is something that to get back, because I'm really interested in not just, you know, lamenting where we were, but how do you actually restore a kind of healthy equilibrium to the system? I think Goliath, to a certain degree, posits that we need to go back to sort of an empowered small business class to some degree and begin to roll back the power of these companies 
to, to, which would have its own side effects. But how do you look at it? Well, there's no question that Citizens United has had what I would consider to be a malignant impact on, right. on American politics. But it was in decline before Citizens United, and, and I think that should be noted, too. A as we think about the impact of Citizens United and how it has un helped to unleash all of this money, and right. we know that these corporations and wealthy individuals don't spend the money just because they spend the money because they want a particular result. Right. And so as a consequence, we have all of this money washing through our system, creating all sorts mm -hmm. of misdirection to get us to move in certain directions that we might not otherwise move. Now, in terms of where do we go from here, yeah. which I think is, is, is the, the big question, uh, I, I am struggling with that because the, the reality is our current class of elected officials, in many cases on both sides of the aisles, are captured by the money. Right. And uh, I, I come back to the notion that people need to, the voters need to understand mm. how that really impacts their daily lives. If you want to know why there's a toxic dump site near your home and not someplace right. else, or why there's not clean water in your community, but there is in others, all of these are political decisions that people right. have to come to grips with. And my view at this point is that most citizens don't understand that the rubber meets the road in their own community. Another showman asks you, is that their fault or is that somebody else's well, fault? Because again, part of there's a little no, bit no, no. of defection I, of responsibility. I, 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 look, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of down on the voter right now yeah. because I think that too many of us have abdicated our right. personal responsibility. I mean, I think that's what I think, uh, Liz and, and Matt, just in the last couple of minutes here, can you tell us uh, as well? I would, I'd really love to hear, Liz Mayer, what you would do. I mean, you're on the Republican side of things. You're a strategist. How would you restore health to the system, just short form? Uh, that's a good question. Um, one thing that I will say from personal experience going way back to high school that I think could be very valuable is let's have better civics education in our schools. And I don't mean people sitting there and teaching the Constitution in classrooms. One of the things that my school did, um, unfortunately, they have curtailed the requirement. But I believe when I was a senior, the requirement was that in uh, we had a five term system at our school, but in the first term, you had to complete, I believe it was 25 right. hours worth of volunteering on a political campaign. 25 hours. Now, if you really want to understand how politics in America mm. works and where there are deficiencies and you want right. to be part of educating voters, putting 25 hours and requiring people to do that, that actually makes a big difference. People have to learn a lot and think a lot more about it than they would if they just have to ace a test. So, so I would say an, that's an, maybe an apprenticeship, one thing. if you will, within the political system. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, Matt, I don't want to create, I don't necessarily right. want to create a glut of future political consultants that I have to compete with. Clearly, that would <laughs> be bad But at least they would be in the ecosystem business. and they would feel and see what was going on. Matt, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah. Uh, you have provoked us uh, with this fascinating book. I'm, I am interested in Wright Patman. I'm interested in whether a Wright Patman would even survive in today's period. But, but just short form, what do you think the steps are to getting back into a world that you think is fairer and better and more just in the U.S. political system? Well, first of all, it's global. Yeah. Um, it's a global problem. We are, uh, we are doing it. That's what's exciting about mm -hmm. this moment. So what you see with candidates like uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and he, even you know a host of, of candidates that have antitrust platforms is a, is a, re a recentering of our politics around political economy, and it's really exciting. Even Trump ran on trade questions, which hasn't really been a part of our politics since the early '90s. So the populism that we're seeing is a mm. good thing, and it is a response to the financial crisis and to a whole series of failures. So I would say, get on board populism. Get on board it. Uh, I'm I'm a democratic left populist. Uh, but fundamentally, we the people have to take responsibility for our society, and we have to reject bad and corrupt leaders that, that have an ideological deference to aristocracy. And we're starting to do that. And that's what's so exciting about this cu current political moment. Even though it seems really bad, there is a rebellion. And I think we should all be a part of that and learn how to restructure our political institutions to deal with these concentrations of power. I'd like to thank you all for being with us in Stanford, Connecticut, Republican strategist Liz Mayer. And with me here in Washington, D.C., Matt Stoller, Research Director at the American Economic Liberties Project, and Howard University political scientist Michael Fontroy. Thanks so much for being with us. So what's the bottom line? Our panelists agree on one big thing, campaigns, American awareness of issues and their civic responsibility, and the power of billionaires and big firms are all out of whack. Liz argues that big money doesn't automatically produce big wins, and a lot of money is spent with no impact. Matt argues that monopolies and violations of public trust have produced the populism America needs at the moment. 
Michael says citizens have failed to live up to their responsibilities as informed citizens. Well, American politics are always a mess, always looking like a highway of corrupt special interests. The founding fathers of the USA worried about these same issues we're debating today, and we're going to be debating them for another 200 years. This story never ends. And that's the bottom line.